go. Welcome to the show. Thank you. This is good. This is um, this is a long time coming, and I don't think uh, we were necessarily conscious of it because you know we we were working together um, for a short while, and um, you know then we started seeing each other's content. We started posting similar things, and um, you know, I think it was uh, only a matter of time before we had a deep dive into the realm of mythology, spirituality, psychology, and and movement as well, because they have that, you know, that's entrenched in those ideas too. Mm. Yeah, dude, it was, uh, <laughs> it was funny thinking about how the, the paths have kind of like uh, intertwined and then, and then grown apart a bit, gone kind of parallel. And, and now it's like, yeah, a bunch of different levels of meshing again. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm really excited to chat. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be good, man. Well, why don't you give everyone a background into um, how you became the Jack White of today? All right. All right. Uh, so this is probably different every time someone asks. So this is always an interesting question, man. Um, sure. But I think, yeah. So from, from a young age, if I start from, from being young, I was born mm. in this little island called Guernsey in the British Channel, just like yeah. a tiny little island. Um, I think it was like a tax haven or something. I don't know. But <laughs> yeah, uh, a small place, but a cool place. And I grew up there. Uh, moved when I was seven to New Zealand. Um, so we lived in the North Island Bay of Plenty for five mm. years and that was great. That was, uh, it was better healthcare for my old man there cause he was older and, um, I got to, to live a life outdoors, you know, and like, it's, it's a small country with a lot of land and a really good like sporting culture. So, um, it was great to, to have that kind of physical upbringing and know what it was like to have space and to be moving often. Mm. Um, and yeah, so five years there and then we eventually moved to Melbourne cause we had some friends here and we visited them a couple of times and it was, it was really cool. Um, and that was my year seven onwards experience in high school. Um, but throughout the way from, from my earliest ages to probably my mid teens, we'd actually moved quite a lot. So we, I was fortunate we got to travel quite a lot to different countries. Sometimes I would go to school there because we'd stay for a while. Um, we'd move house quite a lot too. I think my parents were just kind of adventurous and also kind of got a bit restless when they stayed in one place for too long. It's in the blood. <laughs> um, yeah. So I think I had, if I think about the way my life has gone these days and I'm interested in a, a lot of different things and I kind of delve into to little projects, I suppose, maybe that's what influenced me in that way. I was being exposed to different parts of the world, different mm. like schooling systems, uh, different countries, different sports. And so the, the only common things have been the threads between them because there's been a lot of change basically in my life up to, up to the last few years. So, um, yeah, I started out playing soccer, riding my bike, like mountain biking, BMX stuff. Um, and that was when I was an early teenager. And then, um, from the sporting side, when I was a later teenager towards year 11 and 12, that's when I started getting into rugby and into a little bit of strength training and stuff to kind of complement that. So the strength training at the time was, uh, like bro lifting, basically it started <laughs> off just, <laughs> it was very aesthetic based. It was just a fun thing to do in the gym with the boys at school. Uh, and then it became a bit more of a performance focus as I saw how like Olympic lifting, for example, could in increase my, my running speed or my power on the, on the field. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I played rugby for a while, copped a few injuries and was like, oh, I don't know if I'm quite good enough to risk making this worse mm. so you know i've changed enough sports by now anyway i'll just pack it in and, and keep the the bmx stuff and the, the fun stuff um so that was when i started to get into the like body weight training and i started to get into strength training like olympic lifting specifically um that was about five years ago and that's probably a little bit before we first met mm. um and then on the other side through school I was always into art, was okay. into all the creative stuff. Um, and that drew me towards like English, philosophy, uh, 
studio art, media, all of those subjects that that are super fun but get like graded down in VCE and you don't know what you're going to do with your life afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> Precisely the so, subjects yeah. that would help you answer that question. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. Like I'm so thankful now that, that I went that way and that I had the freedom to go that way and it wasn't like doctor, lawyer, whatever. Mm. But, um, but definitely for ages I was like, this is fun, but what the hell am I going to do? Like mm. there's a lot of, there's a lot of pressure to know in the schooling system and um, especially as you get older, like what are you going to do with these subjects? What path are you choosing in life? And these questions for me have always been overwhelming questions and they still are, like I still don't know. Mm. Um, but it's just been a process of coming to terms with that and being okay with it. Um, and that's kind of led me to this final part where the last few years, maybe the last three, four years have just been a convergence of like the physical, all the different sports, all the little things you learn about your body along the way and the mental, so the creativity, not knowing what the hell you're going to do with your life. And it's all kind of meshing into one gradually and it's a bit of a cohesive thing that I can work with, like a practice. And yeah, so that's, that's now. That's awesome, man. It sounds like you're, uh, you know, yoking the consciousness and the body, the mind and the body. Ah, uh, yoking, yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. Bringing it, it together. That way. Accidentally or otherwise. <laughs> exactly. But there's so much to come from that, you know. I think you can learn a lot um, about the mind from the body and then obviously the mind from the body. What are some of the tools that you've taken from, um, you know, from that physical background? Because uh, you're an incredible mover as well, snatch, clean and jerk. And then, you know, how has that kind of helped you with, um, you know, this fascination towards the mind? Um, so I think, I think the, the physical stuff has always kind of been a, a reflection of who I wanted to be. So I had to get really deep really quickly, but yeah, no, please. I think what, what I realized was like, whatever I did physically was, was usually based on an attraction to a particular image or ideal. Like, you know, at one point I wanted to be like captain of England, like, like yeah. David Beckham. <laughs> and then, and then I was like, Oh, I can't do that. <laughs> uh, well, maybe I could, but I don't think I can. <laughs> so, so there's another one and you're like, Oh, I'm going to go for that. And so like, there's this plucking of different potential identities. And with that, you kind of get swept into like, Oh yeah, I'm a weightlifter now. Like mm. I lift weights. Like I'm big, like I'm strong. That's who I am. And that's what I fall back on when I don't know anything else. Um, so I think to begin with, I was attracted to sports for some unknown identity need reason. Um, and as I've become more aware of how that need or um, tendency has affected my choices, I've been able to draw meaning back from the sports. Mm. But initially it was just like, oh yeah, I'm learning how to work hard. I'm learning how to show up. But it wasn't very deep. It was just like, I like training. So the lessons are just beginning to, to become more profound the more I realise that actually there's a, there's a bigger thing going on. Yes. Can you elaborate on that? What do you mean by a bigger thing? So what I would now refer to is like the practice um, and I guess yogis would call it a yoga practice, movers might call it like a movement practice on the different levels from uh, like I'm alive, therefore I move movement and specific movements. But yep. it's this practice um, of getting to know and exploring the limits of yourself through a particular discipline. Mm, okay. Yep. And I think um, that's such a great segue into identity and belief systems because I think one of the best ways to challenge a belief system is to do something that you didn't think you could do because then that makes your whole habituation kind of crumble. Cause it's like, well, you know, if I got that wrong, what other aspects of me do I have wrong as well? I think move, like moving the body, getting into these tough positions, whether it's a handstand or, you know, stretching the hamstring as you've been doing a lot lately, um, <laughs> you know, yeah. is, is a great way to do that. But yeah, I'd, I'd love for you to, to riff about um, identity, man, because you mentioned it before you know, how you're starting to cling to these projections, you know, um, that's the thing that's going to give you life meaning. And how do you start to kind of render your own meaning from that? Yeah. So I think 
what you mentioned about um, the physical body or the, the, the movement practice, um, breaking down and molding your idea of self is really cool. Um, Cause like it does work both ways. You know, you can't do something or you, you injure yourself and suddenly who you are and how you interact with the world becomes limited in some way by that injury or by even the story that you attach to it. And vice versa, you, you unlock a new movement or you hit some PB in the gym and it's like, Oh, maybe I am actually more now. Maybe I have transcended some past idea of self mm. um again depending on what story you tell but i think i think now what i'm finding most interesting is how certain scenarios and certain um discomfort or or testing times in in the gym or or in a any kind of movement practice can really slap you in the face with y- your thoughts like you can mm. you can realize oh shit, like I've been telling myself this for a while or wait, hang on a sec. What's, what's this thing running in the background? What's this story about um, meaning that I'm telling as I'm doing this thing? Mm. And, and can I, can I just move or just exercise my body without buying into that sort of biting the hook and really like hustling and conflicting with myself? Can I just, can I just move, just walk, just be here, you know? So, mm. which I mean, and it's, yeah, it's a funny one that like, I always find it fascinating when you start talking about, you know, self-development, you start talking about um, individuality, how eventually the more layers you unpack, the more you just start to see the obvious, like it should be, it should be an obvious thing for you just to say, mm. can I just walk without having to try to achieve you know, the fastest walk in the fucking world or, you know, like having to achieve and, and, you know, you know, like got to go for a means and ends type outlook. Can I simply just be, but <clears throat> why, why is it hard for us to just simply be? Uh, uh, I, I, I don't have a great answer for that. Um, it's a it's big a question. question. <laughs> it's, a, it's a cool question, man. I love it. Um, I think, I think part of it is habituation to um, the idea that being isn't enough and that you must be doing, you must be doing for a particular reason to somehow assert your, your place in the world or your value. Um, but I think the, the part that comes off that is we can't always simply be because we think that that's something really hard we think that that's like an additional action we have to take beyond ourselves. And so this idea of being becomes all of a sudden really complex um, because we kind of don't know how in our bodies, but like it's a, it's a practice to just sort of go for a walk. I, mm-hmm. I guess some people have probably grown up in a place in the world where they might have a, a ton of very real pressing human problems, but, perhaps it's easier for them to just go for a walk in some ways. Whereas I know in, in our kind of Western modern society, there's, there's a lot of it is about hitting the next level and getting better, getting better, getting better. Um, and I think that can detract from just being hanging out. Yeah. Cause you, you almost feel like you're not doing enough. Often. Yeah. Often. And, and, these, these dialogues that you have with yourself are always sneakier than you realize because like, I feel like the subconscious is always operating. It's obviously like subconscious. It's, it's happening. It's like the iceberg beneath the water and you only catch wind once the iceberg pops up above the surface and you're like, Oh, gotcha. Yeah. But there's always going to be this delay. Like, yeah, it's, it's kind of a constant cycle really. Mm, mm. And I think even as well, like giving yourself space and time to let that little peak rise above the water as well, because obviously, I mean, part of the reason why I think it's so tough to simply be is because, and this is the paradox of it. We don't, we don't give ourselves time to do it, you know? And then when we do it, we may start to realize why that's actually so important and how many things we're missing when we're just, as you say, habituating and, running through the routine and all that sort of stuff. How was it, how was all this coming to your own personal journey? 
because obviously, I mean, I, I believe this anyway, that things that are really interesting to us and our fascinations aren't really there unless it's kind of me search things that we're trying to move through and guide ourselves through. And so I'm, I'm, I'm interested to hear about like your realizations and, and, and all this. Um, so I think I was, I was interested in these ideas um, external to myself through like English comprehension, philosophy, yeah. reading, but I was like, these are cool things and I can look at them and they're over here and they it didn't really occur to me that all of that is, also all of that complexity and mystery is is in my own head too and it's like nice. behind the lens like nice. um that only really occurred to me when i um i was forced to process a more emotional trauma i mm. think or maybe not forced but maybe just in the process of working through traumas um so my dad died when i was 19 mm. and i was at the time in a very uh what's the what's the way to i coped with it by doing by by being competent like competency despite loss was what gave me comfort and reassurance mm-hmm. and i kind of i kind of just compartmentalized that it was a big thing to process like mum was working through it i was living with her and i felt that the space for me to kind of feel emotions probably wasn't really there at the time or it didn't feel like it was. So my emotional body kind of got pushed aside and I was just like, okay, let's be competent. Let's continue to strive, do well, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And then um, I had a, a relationship with a longtime friend who is a wonderful person and I ended up discovering that who I was in a relationship um, was not the person who I thought I would be. Mm-hmm. And actually I was like, oh, this is a bit rough. And uh, so that kind of went south. When it went south, I was forced to confront the idea that I'm either going to have to hold on to my narrow conception of who I am and how I should be and go down with the ship, like really, truly, um, or I'm going to have to completely like humble myself to the reality that I'm not who I think I am and that I I have to reevaluate myself. And that's when that's when the me search became um, <laughs> like a, a deliberate thing rather than a just maybe like accidental on the side thing. I was like, okay, I have to give some time to these emotions and to myself. Yeah, man. I think you said that so well. I'm fascinated by psychological transformation, obviously. Um, and I think it's so tough, unfortunately, that like you can either be, uh, you can either willingly willingly embrace the unknown or be forced to deal with it, you know, based upon yeah. emotional trauma, um, things like that. Oftentimes, especially us in the West, you and I agree at least that these things confront us because, you know, you know, there's not a whole lot of unknown physically to contend with anymore, you know, because we've explored so much of the world um, and we don't give ourselves time to explore ourselves. So, things happen. We just get hit with panic attacks, you know, things like your father passing, you know, tragedies occur. And then it's just like, wow, identities are stripped. The carpet's pulled from beneath and, um, you know, the descent, uh, comes upon us. So what, what was the first, um, talk us through the, you know, the, the initial stages of that kind of like detachment from identity and kind of how you mediated that. Um, I think, I think it was, it wasn't like the most graceful process. It was like, of course. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I'm trying to actually, I'm trying to think how, how I did deal with it. Um, I think I'll just tell the story of what literally happened and then maybe that'll help. (laughs) Um, So yeah. So had, had a breakup was in Melbourne for a while afterwards, uh, still somewhat in contact with my ex. She'd had a death in the family. I was treading the line between trying to be a friend and realizing that she probably didn't need me as a friend and Mm -hmm. all that. And then eventually I was like, I think I just need a change of scenery. I think I need to, the detachment kind of happened geographically and physically first. So I was like, okay, I'm going to go stay with my brother. My brother, I have three brothers. Um, The one I stayed with, lives in um lives about an hour outside of london i was like i'm gonna stay with him just hang out 
like take some time maybe i'll work in the city over there i don't know like just let's start fresh um and i think just having that physical space helped help me to set my sights on something um new and kind of expand my sense of who i was beyond just oh i'm like this heartbroken mess i can be oh, maybe i could be this too <laughs> yes um and so yeah stayed there uh ended up actually kind of just working as a bit of a nomadic pt dirt bag like <laughs> trying to <laughs> hand out flyers and do training sessions in the park um and i was having my days were full of a bit more structure. I, I gave myself a structure like daily nice. uh, journaling when I woke up or meditation and listening to a shit ton of Alan Watts. Nice. Oh, <laughs> and, I love and, him. Um, yeah, so good. And from there, my days were getting clearer and I was feeling like who I, who I was uh, being was more deliberate and was based on like deliberate actions that had been considered based on values that I, I wanted to move towards. Um, but my, interestingly, my nights were just full of fucking nightmares, full of like literally just tortured by my dreams about stuff. So wow. obviously things were happening, things were changing or things were coming up. Um, yeah. and yeah, that's when I kind of started meditating almost daily and I, I had to gave myself a few productivity tasks and I was writing more and. And from then on, uh, that was in 2016 or 17, that whole practice has just, it's always been in the background, although I'm not like consistent with it. It's always just, yeah. Man, I'm, I, I'm pumped that you said uh, your dreams were um, really starting to happen. So the, the unconscious yeah. river was starting to overflow. And did you ever, did you analyze them? Did you... Uh, I didn't go deep, um, partly because I think I was so I was so sick of having them. I was so sick of thinking about the same things or even like having them in my mental landscape. I was like, I dealt with this for real. Like, I don't want to, or, or did I? Whatever. <laughs> I don't want to deal. <laughs> I don't want to deal with it again. Like, can't I just sleep? Yes. Um, yeah, I didn't really go into it. A lot of it was just like, you know. <laughs> just like oh fuck i miss i miss particular things about our relationship oh yeah like I'm still obviously very physically attracted to you and maybe mm -hmm. my whole conception of your identity was a bit unfair maybe a big part of that was actually just i thought you were really hot and that was just that made me feel better about myself and like i i guess it started to unpack but it wasn't like i wasn't going for it i was yeah. just kind of ha having to think about it because it was there Man, it's fascinating. I, I really, I love, um, I, I'm addicted to dream analysis. Like I'm, I'm the most annoying boyfriend in the world. Cause like every time <laughs> I wake up next to my partner, I'll be like, so what did you dream about? <laughs> Get the notepad and pen out and, you know, but, um, they are windows into, into the soul, you know, and you can find out so much about what you are trying to move through, you know, whether or not you say it, um, what you are trying to move through is implicit in your behavior because behavior is um, sometimes more often than not unconscious. So I think it's so cool that you said that man, because um, you know, it just, it's just a direct reflection of how we move through psychological transformation. Isn't it? That idea that, you know, we can move away geographically, as you said, but psychologically it's not, you know, the change won't happen until we confront what it is that we need to confront. Um, and then, as you said, you started listening to a hell of a lot more Alan Watts and all this sort of stuff. Is that around the time that you started to bring the spiritual aspect into the work you were doing with the movement and, and the training and all that? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, I I think I heard of Ido's work a while before that but wasn't, like, super interested. Um, and then when I started meditating more, listening to Alan Watts, um, and sort of questioning like my idea of self, it, it all just kind of meshed into one a bit. And I, I think like that whole Eastern approach towards, I don't know, maybe spirituality or psychoanalysis or, or like metaphysics and philosophy, I think is in a lot of like Edo stuff, you know, it's like the, the sort of Taoist like 
semi-Buddhist, somewhat Shaolin monk kind of Wu Wei stuff. So they said it. Yeah, they they just began to tie in, and I was like, okay, so this is something that this is something that I can explore more deeply, which mm. not only fulfills my need to like build my body, um, but also to explore these ideas in philosophy and yeah, in myself. Man, that's so cool. I, I think um, I think that's so um, important, and it's it's a lesson that I need to take on as well because so much of those teachings talk about how it's only awareness is the only step is, is, is not the only step. The other step is obviously integration and actually um, cultivating the connection between the mind and body based on the work you do um, is that integration phase. It's like, yes, I understand that I should be more in my heart and I should, you know, Wu Wei, you know, try not to force things, but how do I actually do it? It's like, well, you're actually, taking yourself and taking your clients and things through that actual process. So I, I, I love the background, man. Um, talk to me now more about kind of the work you do and, you know, how, how that's different to, I suppose, just general movement. Um, so what I, what I've kind of realized is that um, what holds people back is probably less so their lack of knowledge, although that is important, like knowledge of training, knowledge of movement, it's definitely important, it's essential. But often um, a lot more of what's holding them back that they don't realise is, is that they're just, they're thinking they should do something that they don't really want to do or they're thinking that they need to, to move or, or train in a particular way because that's like how you do it properly or like uh, there are all these kind of brands, brands of movement. And because I identify that searching and that like pigeonholing in myself, um, it's, it's kind of the natural thing for me to try to help people with that and to say, you've realized that the most important thing is you, your body, your mind, how you feel. This knowledge is all here. You should definitely learn, but you don't have to choose. Like there's no, there's no wrong or right way provided you're enjoying this and you're kind of doing what you want and you're, you're looking after your body and progressing in a positive direction. So I, I think now my coaching has become much more about um, integrating aspects of mindfulness or aspects of yoga with more modern um, or perhaps not modern, perhaps just more personalized strength training or mobility training and it's seeing them not as separate um but as actually like one practice where you can you might be doing your chin ups for example like i've been filming this in my story i've been doing this one on chin program and i'm like doing my chin ups and thinking or inquiring into how does this feel right now like how am i approaching this um what association with these chin ups am i cultivating by having this mindset and doing this exercise like, why am I doing it? Mm. And it's not like I have to answer all those questions. It's just an inquiry. Um, and this idea kind of the practitioner who I've seen do it really well and who I've kind of adopted this from is Devin Kelly. I don't know if you've heard of him. He's, he's no. like working out of, so he's, uh, he used to be a yoga teacher. He's now sort of just into strength, mobility. He's an absolute beast. Very, very interested in psychology and philosophy. And he's kind of, combine the two so it's this wow. it's using the physical as a as a mirror for the mental um well wow. and i guess you could say it's kind of like yoga if yoga didn't mean getting on a mat and speaking sanskrit words <laughs> and holding particular shapes <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so yeah that's so cool yeah I, I love that um i think intention is massive um yeah, so so the why people are doing it. Um, you mentioned Alan Watts for one of, one of my favorite things that he says. I, I literally try to remind myself of this like daily. Is um, he says I'll try to do the accent. He goes, people are always asking me, you know, um, you know, is it necessary? Is it necessary to meditate? Why do this? Why do that? You know, and his idea behind that is like, well, it depends on what you want in life. Like if it's if you're driving to New York, it's necessary to take the highway. Um, having that why to train because I think that'll help with people refining 
their modality. It's like, well, what do you want? Do you want to snatch hundred kilos? Amazing. Well, then you probably don't want to be doing yoga. Um, how much of that comes into your method? Like you said, it was a big, big thing, the why, but how does that like play out in, in your coaching? Like, do you get people to write down their whys and things and that changes your approach of? Yeah. At the moment I have a, the process is always changing with like new students and how I onboard them. Um, yeah. Cause like every person I train with gives me some ideas for, Oh, I could ask that or I could, but, but there's definitely this process of inquiry that we start off with. So like I send a few questions, a lot of them are like, um, how are you feeling in your current state of being? It might be quite a general felt kind of question, very open. And um, if your if your state of being or if your life uh, was asking something of you, what might that be? Um, and then it kind of gets more specific into like, what do you want to learn? Like, do you want to, yeah, do you want to snatch a hundred kilos? Do you want to, do you want to get a, a handstand? Do you want to, whatever it is, but we, I try without imposing answers to, to offer a bit of a structure, which can show how these, these um, more spiritual or emotional or mental inquiries can lead into clarity with specific action. Mm. Um, because, because that's the process that I struggled for so long to integrate. Yes. That makes sense. Deepest pain leads to the purpose. That's awesome, man. And just for everyone listening, by the way, Jack can seriously move very strong, very good at oh, gymnastics. Sorry. It's well, mate, it's you, you are, <laughs> um, have you, have you done weightlifting recently? No, I haven't done a lot. Like yeah. every, every couple of months I kind of get around a barbell, but definitely. How's your back? Used to, yeah. So for, for those of you who don't know me, I had, a maybe 2015, I had a pretty bad back injury that just came from like a routine squatting session. Um, but it was after a long flight, probably just had tight hips. It probably wasn't complicated, but, uh, herniated a couple of discs in my back. And then, uh, from then on, I've had this kind of long nonlinear recovery process. Uh, at the moment it's good. And I think it's probably better than it's ever been, but at the same time, I'm not really testing it in the same way as doing the same stuff I used to do. Yeah. Um, so I've kind of, I haven't let go of my expectation to be strong and capable and be able to move weights, but I also, it's not a ruling factor in my training now. It's like, I'm going to do that if my body feels good, but I'm not going to think you should be able to do that, you know? Mm. Yeah. And I think that's a really, I mean, that clearly shows in the methodology, um, you know, that you ingrain in your clients and your, your students, um, you know, that idea that, depending on your why is, is how you should train, you know? Yeah. I think yeah, that's really a big, cool. A big, a big part of that too is like your why is totally cool. Like you, you, even if you don't know, that's cool. Like it's the pressure can't be put on the why the why has to be like honest. And the, the biggest task is being okay with your honest why. And if your honest mm. why isn't, isn't that you want to like win this or win that or if your why is however silly it seems if that's what's driving you it's not silly and there's a way to there's a way to make it work for you dude i think that's so important what you just said i don't think i've any really heard anyone explain it like that you're so right because we get lost in this idea that like my why is gonna be the next steve jobs you know i'm gonna like make the next uber happen or you know whatever um but uh, sometimes your why can just be because I enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. It's uh, the the big why that drives you and picks you up when you when you <laughs> like the, you know, David Goggins is why <laughs> kind of thing. That's pow- a powerful why. Yeah, yeah. It, we don't all have that. <laughs> Man, that's so true. A lot of people ask me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, God. I mean, like, it, it doesn't mean we can't end up doing fucking hectic cool stuff it's just like you won't if you're trying to use someone else's why <laughs> absolutely man hey dude just to bring it back what 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 is your um you know from the moment you started this me search approach to to where you are now what's kind of like the biggest lesson that you've you've learned something that you can give us all 
really coming at me, bro. Really coming <laughs> at me with the questions. The big ones. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, probably uh, you are in control of a lot less than you think, like a lot less than you think. Mm -hmm. But if you accept that, you'll probably more empowered, be more empowered than you've been to do what you feel you need to do. <laughs> wow. Okay. You've got to elaborate that. Cause that's good. Yeah. So like, um, the more I, the more I kind of inquire through meditation or through reading and learning about bits and bobs of psychology and philosophy, the more, uh, and even physiology, the more I'm, I'm kind of convinced at least for now that we don't have that much control over why things happen. Um, in our body externally we or if we if we do have a role to play we don't know what part of that role is causing that thing to happen we don't really understand mm. it as well as we think so i think it's safer to assume that we understand very little safer to assume that we control very little and to accept that um and in accepting it you can kind of start from a fresh real grounded honest orientation and then take some steps that work. Um, but, but if you're on, if you're under this illusion that you have more control than you do, you're going to strive for things. They're not going to work and you, you won't know why. And you'll think that you can figure it out. You think that you're, you're smart enough to understand your internal workings. So I guess you don't have much control. So keep it really simple. Uh, and maybe you'll get somewhere. Mm. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like a bottom up approach. I don't even, yeah, I don't even know, man. Uh, like, you kind of screwed my mind over with that question. It's such a cool one. <laughs> I think you're right though. I think you're right. Like if you take the, if you take that approach that you're in control of much less than you think you are, when life goes your way, it's like a little reward. But if you think you're in control of everything and then subsequently everything fails around you, it's just this expectation that will never get met. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you just made me think of another thing, which is like, you know, you've got Jocko and like extreme ownership and discipline equals freedom. And, and I'm fully with that too, which I don't want to send out the impression that I'm like, we, we can't do anything. Like I think we can be incredibly empowered and I totally believe in like uh, owning whatever you do. But at the same time, I don't know if I can express this, clearly right now but at the same time there's a letting go that happens there's this like shedding of the expectation uh shedding of the control but you still do things you still do things you're just i guess trying to let go of the layer that's trying too hard or figuring it out and and get more into the actual doing like just kind of do it yes live so i guess that's kind of like the woo way thing like effortless action everything gets done um, but I think the way to get better at getting it all done is to let go of some things. Mm, mm. And think about, <clears throat> yeah, think about again, like coming back to your point about the why, like why you're doing it as well. Because I think I believe that effortless action comes about when, you know, when we find our flow, like when we're doing things because we just simply enjoy doing them. There's no means and ends, you know, it's, it's Dharma. It's, it's, good work, you know, the fruit of the labor is in the labor. Um, I, I, I've certainly found that in my own experience, you know, um, when we're flowing because it's not like we're doing anything so that A, B and C. It's just we're doing it because this is what we would do if we were financially independent, if we were totally spiritually liberated, if we, if we were the only person living, we would do this, you know? Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, that's cool. I, I like that. It's, it's, um, you're living in accordance with, with who you, who you want to become or who you see your, your most clear, peaceful, integrated self being um, rather than painting it as an external picture. And that's the cool thing about flow. Like uh, you're not inducing this separateness between you and the activity you're just wholeheartedly embodying what you're doing. Mm. And I think that's what I, part of the surrender is 
surrendering <clears throat> everything which which disconnects you from the moment and from the flow and from the work and the craft. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And so so the craft becomes you. Yeah, totally. Totally. It's uh it becomes not it, it's no longer delaying gratification so that you can get to somewhere where you're not. There is gratification in the action um, and it's consistent because you've aligned yourself with that action. Mm. It's one in the same. There's no internal conflict anymore. It's gratifying to do what's productive because you're a producer. Like that is, that is, yeah. Yes. The vessel. Yeah. Dude, I knew we'd get deep. I love that. Um, mate, what are you working on now? Anyway, what's coming up? The handstand program you were saying? Um, yeah, so I've got a, a a manual that I wrote, like a Word document kind of thing for a workshop that I delivered last year and kind of went alongside the in-person teachings. And I realized that without the in-person teaching, it's, it's, it's just a Word document, like it's a right. bit dry. So I was like, <laughs> yes, yeah, so like I'm, I'm going to film some stuff and basically Sick. either link link all the exercises to videos or put segments with segments of the, the documents. So you've got like a big resource. Um, so that's the immediate one. And um, in the in the process, I'm learning a lot about like content production and and rights to to use, and that's screwing with my head. But I'm, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> That's classic. It's the way of the world, hey? Mate, where can people find you? Um, so Instagram, just Jack White, because I'm the one and only Jack White and there Amazing. is no other Jack White. <laughs> yeah. You got a half brother out there who was in a band called Tenacious D and uh, I think he's doing some other things. <laughs> I've never heard of him. I don't know what you're talking about, man. <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm talking about Jack Black. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but definitely nothing to do with the white stripes. No, so exactly. Jack White on Instagram. <laughs> Jackwhitemovement.com is my website and there's a Facebook oh, cool. page under the same name. Um, uh, and I think that's about it for the moment. That's all the, the virtual stuff. Yep. Awesome, yeah. dude. And what's, what's like one thing that uh, people can do right now after having listened to this podcast um, to kind of better – their, their connection between the mind and the body, like some kind of movement or some kind of practical step you'd give the listeners? Mm, yeah, I think, I think a lot of this is you can just move without knowing why and without having a reason, without setting parameters. Like you can, you can do things without having a good reason. It's perfectly fine just, you know, it's life affirming to be a little bit spontaneous sometimes. And, mm. and you might, I mean, when I started practicing this and still now, like sometimes I'll do that and I'll be a bit hard on myself. I'll say, Oh, like, what are you doing? There's this, there's this voice of judgment, but even <laughs> that, like, that's just part of the practice. That's part of learning. Um, but in terms of the mind body thing, um, I probably, I probably echo what Edo says, which is kind of like there, there is no mind and body in the sense that you can't, a human doesn't really come in two halves. You know, you can't really, you can't really separate mind body. You can't really separate the organism that we are from our environment. Like mm. as Alan Watts would say, we're, we're an organism environment. So reframing the whole thing to just to realize that there's nothing that you have to connect because you're already it. Like you're already, a mind and a body and all of it, like in one thing there is nice. So you're complete. Just explore the vehicle. Just fuck with it. Have some fun. Use your body adventure. Oh man. You just give me the title of the podcast, explore the vehicle. That's cool. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Yeah. Dude, thanks yeah, so like much that. for doing the show. Pleasure, man. Absolute pleasure. It's great to chat. Yeah, for sure. It is good. It actually is good to chat. I'm sure we'll, um, We'll have to go. I think we're in the same area or in Melbourne, roughly speaking. So be good to um, grab a coffee when everything blows over. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Awesome. All right. Cheers, everyone. Peace. Mate, good sesh. Thanks, bro. Yeah, Loved you're, it. You're, uh, after, after 400 or so podcasts, you definitely, you know how to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> I, try, I try to just like, I try to be really selfish and just like ask the questions that I really want the answers to. So like I, I pick my guests cause I'm like, I really want to get inside their head. 
So then like if the listeners want to listen, they can listen. If they don't, that's brilliant. But like this is just an education for me, you know, um, which is obviously the reason why I want to get you on the show because you've got that that movement, that stuff in there as well. And I, I love the the social media as well, man. Ah, thanks, bro. Yeah. No, I appreciate, appreciate your time as well because every time someone asks me these questions, it's like it, um, it's a process that I can't really do myself. So it's kind of selfish in this end too. Like, like it's like uh, we did this thing on uh, one of my teacher trainings. It was like a co-meditation, like a dyad thing where you'd, you'd inquire. Someone would facilitate the inquiry. And I feel like a good chat, like the old style philosophy is just – it just uncovers all this cool stuff. Oh man, hundred percent. Cause it gives you time to actually think about the way you see the world, you know? Um, yeah. That's why I love it. I love it. Yeah. You should do a podcast, dude. You should get your own podcast. <laughs> yeah. I've been toying with the idea. I might, I might do. I might do it, do. man. For yeah. sure. It'd be sick. That'd be really good. I think everyone should write and everyone should have a podcast. I'm the biggest believers in the two. Mm. Yeah. Good things. Hey, wholesome yeah. things. Wholesome things. Yeah. Dude, I'll, I'll let you know um, when the show comes out. Um, if you want to plug it and share it, I'll um, make some snippets and things. And um, I th- yeah, getting some good listeners up there now. So um, should be good. Hopefully it helps with the with the kind of stuff you're putting out there now as well. So, Oh, yeah, for sure, dude. It'd be great. Yeah, awesome, man. Really good. Yeah. Cool, man. Cool, dude. I'll talk to you soon, hey? All right. Sounds good. Enjoy the rest of your day. Yes. Thank you, mate. I'll try to get a bit warmer. It's fucking cold. Are you, you're Southeast, aren't you? Are you in the Southeast? Yeah. I'm in Cheltenham. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, Chelsea, Chelsea Heights. Uh, Chelsea Heights. Cool. Not too good, far, man. dude. Yeah. Not, not too far at all. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, post COVID, yeah. post COVID coffee. <laughs> exactly. Dude, our favorite cafe is, um, Jack the lad. Oh, uh-huh, seriously. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, mean, gotta, I, I know the people who opened that. Um, oh, the English dude they, with the big. Yeah. Uh, Mikey. Mikey. I think that's, yeah, it's obviously his name. Yeah. 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 It's yeah, such he's, good he's, coffee. He's, such a small world. <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll definitely grab a coffee when this all, all this blows over, man. It'd be good to catch up. Cool. Yeah, dude. Yeah, dude. In the meantime, I'll, I'll stay, uh, I'll stay like, Oh, I don't even know what to say. I just froth your content and I'll keep frothing your content. I'll keep up to date. <laughs> yeah, mate, vice versa. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Dude, I'll talk soon, hey? Alrighty. Sounds good, man. See ya. <laughs>